Thank you so much, Alyssa, and thanks to the whole uh, organizing committee for um, uh, inviting me to present on uh, our team's work uh, looking at small molecule uh, kinase degraders. This is my uh, disclosure slide. As mentioned, most relevant uh, to this is C4, as well as Deerfield, who's funded the greater research at uh, Dana-Farber. So I thought I would start off with sort of an introduction to the kinome and, and why we think uh, making kinase degraders would be uh, interesting. And then I'll talk about our initial forays into this effort, which I would say were uh, quite sort of opportunistic, working on, on kinases that we'd already uh, worked on. And then uh, I'll talk about a large systematic study that we've recently undertaken in collaboration with Eric Fisher's lab to globally survey uh, the proteome for kinases that are most easily uh, degraded. So I want to start with acknowledging that this work is the effort of a large uh, team we've assembled at, at Dana-Farber, uh, mostly in, in my lab and in Eric's lab. And the study in particular has been spearheaded by Catherine Donovan and Fleur Ferguson, as well as through a host of international uh, collaborations with folks that have been sending us uh, compounds uh, from across the globe. So I think everyone knows kinases have been a very productive uh, drug discovery uh, target class. In my last count, there's about 48 approved uh, kinase inhibitors, uh, the majority of which are ATP uh, competitive, and the most successful ones being ones that target oncogenic uh, drivers like BCR able in CML or EGFR in small cell lung cancer. But there's also been activity of kinase inhibitors uh, outside of, uh, of cancer. There's been a desire to expand the scope of how we inhibit uh, kinases. And so over the years, people have made compounds that are primarily what are called uh, type 1 inhibitors that bind active kinases, or uh, type 2 inhibitors that trap kinases in inactive conformations, or allosteric inhibitors, uh, for example, allosteric inhibitors of MEK or allosteric inhibitors of uh, mTOR, uh, like the, uh, like the Rapalogs. So I'd say the field suffers now from two major challenges. Uh, the first is that uh, we've pretty much mined uh, the genome for clear single kinase dependencies uh, in cancer. Uh, there's still room for you know, making you know, more selective inhibitors, inhibitors that can overcome resistance, but it's clear that the majority of, of solid tumors uh, will not respond to monotherapy a kinase inhibitor, or if they do, there'll be uh, rapid resistance. And then of course, resistance in general, even in cases where the initial response is very good, has ultimately limited uh, therapy. And mutations uh, can cause you know, resistance through blocking uh, drug binding, but you can also get uh, compensation through upregulation of other uh, pathways. And so there's clear interest in ways to extend uh, the reach of uh, targeted therapeutics in kinases. And today I'll, I'll focus on what I think are some of the opportunities specifically for kinase inhibitors uh, to achieve this. So just sort of a historical approach to how we've gone about uh, looking for new inhibitors in, uh, in the lab. It has been sort of a gene family uh, centric approach where we've built combinatorial libraries of uh, kinase privileged scaffolds. We've implemented many of the screening technologies that are available. Um, a Kinative developed by uh, Ben Kravat's lab and commercialized by uh, ActiveX, uh, DiscoverX, uh, you know, phage display uh, kinases, uh, kinome panels, uh, and have used that to annotate uh, these libraries looking for scaffolds that are uh, privileged and over the years have learned you know many rules and tricks for how to get selectivity for uh, different kinases. We've primarily focused on uh, understudied kinases and kinases where there has not been enough literature precedent for nominating uh, those enzymes as uh, targets and that's really been sort of the, the sweet spot for us working uh, in academia uh, with physician scientists to annotate and make tool compounds and then make those compounds generally available. So over the years, uh, the lab has made a lot of uh, sort of tool compounds. These are compounds with the, the level of potency and selectivity that you can use to validate the target in cellular assays. Occasionally, we'll you know, move these compounds also into uh, efficacy studies. But then, you know, unlike pharmaceutical companies, will often you know, make these compounds freely available uh, and distribute them widely. And very often, these compounds have been you know, useful for finding uh, new functions and new targets of these uh, enzymes, and sometimes in completely unanticipated ways. So for example, this mTOR inhibitor, TORIN-1, 
was used by the community to annotate mTOR function, but then researchers, for example, in Portugal, found that it was very active against the malaria parasite and launched an effort to find its target in, in plasmodium that led to some uh, drug discovery efforts. So it's really clear that, that making these tool compounds available is, is a useful thing to do, and that's sort of been a, a key thing for that has done. So our entry into the protein degradation field was because of our geographic proximity to Jay Bradner's lab, who had the amazing finding in 2015 that they could make very efficient degraders of uh, their favorite protein, uh, BRD4, by making a bivalent uh, compound linking thalidomide with, uh, with JT1. And got this you know, really impressive and, and rapid uh, degradation. And I remember uh, the day that the lab got this result, I was, I was talking with Jay, and I think we were both incredulous that you know, this large you know, bivalent molecule which defies all the, the, the rules that we have for having you know, good cell penetration and good features, was able to you know, have this potency uh, and this level of efficacy. Uh, because you know, I think one of the, the knocks on the field had been you know, that this would be the realm of chemical biology and we could never really make uh, potent selective compounds that could be advanced. But this uh, finding really uh, changed that thinking. And so we, as well as you know, many people in the field, Really wanted to ask, you know, how how general is this approach? Can we, you know, rapidly make these bivalent molecules and you know degrade any target of, uh, of interest? And one thing that we immediately started thinking about was that the pharmacology of these molecules, as has been mentioned in, in previous seminars, is really you know dramatically uh, different. So you know, typically medicinal chemists are focused on you know finding compounds that will have you know high affinity slow off rates and you need to maintain you know that target occupancy to get so full suppression of the enzymatic uh, function but because these molecules job the bivalent molecules job is to promote uh, ubiquitylation through ternary complex formation really the properties that you're seeking are quite uh, different so you're actually looking for a compound that will stabilize a catalytically competent ternary complex formation and then get ubiquitylation uh, and, and degradation. And so it means that many of the things that you normally think about in terms of having uh, high affinity and slow off rates are, are quite different. And that means when you start developing these compounds, you need a whole suite of different assays to really efficiently identify and optimize them. So, you know, clearly, you need to have assays that can measure, you know, binding to either end of the of the compound. You know, that's that's traditional uh, biochemistry. But as I mentioned, many of these compounds are a hair's breadth away from not being uh, cell permeable, and so you often uh, need to assess the ability of these compounds to get into cells. We developed a number of assays uh, over the years uh, for doing that, mainly focused on uh, competition, where you measure the ability of your new degrader to compete away a degrader of known function that degrades, for example, a, a reporter. And you'll often see that tiny changes in the, in the chemical structure will make a, a dramatic difference about whether you get degradation and whether you get cell penetration. Then clearly, you know, you need to look at target degradation. That's typically done uh, classically by Western blotting, but you know, nobody wants to run uh, thousands of Western blots to look at concentrations and cell types and dose series. Uh, and so really uh, developing assays for looking at that sufficiently. Uh, we tend to use the system from Promega, initially developed by Promega, this HIBIT system. Uh, that's been a very uh, effective assay for looking at degradation. Then it's very important to look at, you know, both how fast the degradation happens and then how fast the protein gets uh, resynthesized, right? So if you have a ra very rapidly resynthesized protein, the uh, effect you might get from degradation, you know, could be, could be less, you know, unless even transient destruction of the protein is enough to see the desired pharmacology. Then another important feature, which I'll show later, is that the graders can show vastly different effects in different uh, tissue types and uh, cell types. And so you really need to understand uh, where you're getting degradation and the kinetics with which uh, that is happening. And then finally, you know, a lot of the rules that we have around uh, looking at the potency and selectivity of, of small molecules in terms of their in vivo properties is quite different uh, for degraders. So one of the sort of surprising findings 
has been that you know degraders can work at extremely low uh, concentrations. So actually, we have several degraders where we can't even quantify their plasma concentrations, but we're still getting very effective uh, degradation. And so uh, we've resorted often to looking at pharmaco, you know, dynamics degradation of the target uh, as a surrogate to whether the drug is there, and not so much on exactly the drug uh, concentration. So. These are some of the, the, the hoped for uh, you know, advantages that you might see from uh, degraders. And I'll try to give you know, some examples of, of, of cases where we've run into these differences. Uh, perhaps you know, the most promising uh, avenue, which has been uh, talked about in previous seminars, is being able to target proteins that don't have classical uh, drug-like uh, binding pockets. Uh, that's not going to be an emphasis of mine today, because obviously kinases have very good uh, drug binding pockets, but even for kinases, we're very interested in unique ways of binding to kinases because you can imagine advantages to being able to have a, a traditional uh, orthosteric inhibitor, a classical kinase inhibitor, uh, combined with a degrader, and you may want to do that uh, by binding to do two different sites on the uh, on the kinase. So our entry into uh, kinase degraders actually starts with a uh, failure, which I think is important uh, you know, to mention. Uh, everything that gets published in the degrader field is a, is a success, and we don't have a proper measure for the number of cases that technology uh, fails on, and so I thought it'd be useful uh, to mention that. And actually, our first failure was targeting the pseudokinase uh, HER3. So HER3 is perhaps a less famous member of the EGFR uh, kinase family member, so, uh, where EGFR is the most famous member, uh, the target of um, uh, Tegristo, for example, in non-small cell lung cancer. But the EGFR family has four uh, members, and they uh, act as obligate um, heterodimers at the cell surface uh, to lead to successful uh, signaling. And actually, EGFR and HER2 both depend on obligate heterodimerization with uh, HER3. But HER3 hasn't been targeted uh, by small molecules because it's a pseudokinase. And it's a pseudokinase uh, because certain residues in the ATP site are mutated, and so it has negligible phosphotransferase activity. It's not really a, a kinase. But it has been validated as a target uh, through various uh, antibody-based approaches where you try to prevent heterodimerization at the cell surface. So a number of years ago, the lab set out to make uh, effective HER3 uh, binders and we noticed that there was an unusual uh, cysteine residue, cysteine uh, 721, and we were able to make uh, very effective sort of first-in-class covalent ligands of HER3, exemplified by this TX185 uh, compound. And consistent with HER3 being a pseudokinase, uh, these compounds had almost no uh, pharmacology. They had no antiproliferative activity. They didn't really affect HER3 uh, signaling. And so we thought that this would be a great platform uh, for making a degrader. And actually, this started out as a collaboration with Craig Cruz's lab. We tried both this hydrophobic adamantane uh, tagging approach, uh, and we also tried, you know, Cerebellon and VHL-based recruitment. And we were really not able to get effective degraders of uh, HER3. And actually, to this day, uh, we haven't really been able to degrade HER3. And that really made us want to take a step back and try to ask, you know, what makes a kinase uh, more or less uh, degradable? And so we had a study from a couple of years ago where we, you know, intentionally tried to make a promiscuous kinase degrader, and we had a lot of experience making promiscuous kinase inhibitors. And so we elaborated uh, this very well-known uh, dianolino uh, pyrimidine uh, kinase inhibitor, uh, the progenitor compound to a compound called uh, TAE684, which later became an ALK. Uh, inhibitor, but if you basically make this compound uh, and you you leave out certain structural features like the orthomethoxy group, it's a very uh, promiscuous uh, kinase binder. You can see that here from this kinome profile. Looks like the end of the game at Battleship. All the all the ships have been uh, bound, and actually uh, several hundred kinases are engaged by this compound. But we made the remarkable finding when we did proteomics that actually a limited number of kinases were degraded. So only about 23 or so kinases in this study uh, were degraded, despite you know, quite promiscuous uh, binding. And at some level, you know, that makes sense. For something to be degraded, uh, you have to have more than binding, right? You have to have 
the ternary complex form, presumably, you need ubiquitilation. Ubiquitilation has to lead to degradation. And there's many uh, links along that pathway that might be disrupted that would prevent something from being effectively degraded. But we got really excited about this because from this you know, single experiment, we had enough work in the lab to then go in and see, could we indeed use this prospecting information to then go in and make selective degraders for our, our favorite kinases of interest? And the first one we started working on was Bruton's uh, tyrosine kinase, which is a very uh, famous and, and validated uh, kinase target in a variety of B-cell uh, tumors. And this kinase turned out to be extremely uh, easy to degrade, so many different uh, degraders uh, would degrade it. And we thought this would be an interesting test case because the lead drug that's out there right now, uh, ibrutinib, and then there's a second compound called acalabrutinib, they're both covalent uh, inhibitors. They require obligate bond formation with cysteine uh, 41 to be effectively inhibiting. But we thought if we made an, a non-covalent uh, protac uh, that didn't require high occupancy, that might be a very interesting way uh, to overcome that cysteine uh, mutation. Uh, so Dennis Darbanovsky in the lab teamed up with uh, Eric Wang to explore this idea. And they used very nice uh, BTK binders uh, that had been developed by others and made simple uh, bivalent uh, recruiters. When we typically do this, we'll make compounds uh, that have the uh, active uh, glutaramid binder. And then we typically make a negative control either by uh, eliminating uh, this carbonyl group, just making this methylene, or by methylating uh, this uh, glutaramid uh, group to disable uh, cerebellum binding. That turns out to be an important uh, control so you can figure out you know, what pharmacology comes from inhibition versus what comes from degradation. Because remember, we still have the active kinase inhibitor here. We haven't disabled it as a kinase binder. We've just given this additional property of being able to be a degrader. And then this slide shows some of the kind of assays and thinking uh, that goes into these types of uh, compounds. And so uh, ideally, you know, we get a crystal structure but more realistically, we just do uh, docking to try to understand you know, the molecular interaction that's formed between the, the BTK uh, binding portion here and then the linker segment that goes down uh, into the binding pocket uh, of, uh, of cerebellum. And then understanding what the trajectory of that ternary complex formation is can give you ideas about uh, how to minimize uh, the structure, how to rigidify the linker, how to uh, further optimize the compound. Then, of course, it's important to establish that you still have uh, binding selectivity, that you're able to induce a, a ternary complex formation. Again, these molecules form this uh, uh, classic hook behavior where you have a series of concentrations where you get ternary complex formation, but you know, either too low or too high, you don't get that. And then, as I mentioned, this cell penetration is extremely uh, important. Uh, you have to be able to you know, get into cells, but amazingly, Often compounds with very, very low cell penetration uh, can still show uh, degradation. We then go in and, and look at uh, target degradation, uh, typically by Western blotting, or as I mentioned, by this hybrid assay. So you can see this degrader degraded BTK uh, very effectively, 100 nanomolar for two hours. It's uh, completely degraded. And then it's very important to prove uh, to yourself that the degradation is happening uh, on a mechanism. And so the way we do that is either by uh, blocking the proteasome, the vertezimid, or disabling uh, the nettylation enzyme required for uh, the ubiquitin enzymes to be active, or most importantly, competing away binding either at the, the E3 portion or the, the targeting portion. And these are really important because you know many protac compounds will put the cells under stress or in some cases, they cross-react with GSPT1, an important uh, translation factor, which then can make it look like it is degradation when, in fact, it's uh, you know, degradation but through a, a nonspecific mechanism. So as advertised, because these compounds don't require you know, covalent bonding to the cysteine 481, we can actually see equipotent degradation of either wild-type BTK or this uh, cysteine mutation. And you can see the same thing in, in proliferation assays. Uh, the degrader is much more um, able to overcome uh, that mutation, right? But this doesn't mean that the degrader uh, compound is going to be less susceptible uh, to resistance. And so, so through studies, some of which are, are not published yet, uh, you can basically see resistance either through uh, loss of expression of the ligase, 
or in other cases, you can actually find mutations at the protein-protein interface that prevent uh, successful ternary complex formation and prevent degradation. So like any targeted therapy, there's clear ways for tumor cells to evolve uh, resistance. But I think the good news is that the resistance mechanisms tend to be orthogonal to those of a classical orthosteric inhibitor, right? So a classical orthosteric inhibitor, you'll get mutations in the drug binding site that reduce occupancy. Those mechanisms are not as effective for a degrader. And so that's why I think for kinases, there's a real opportunity around um, combination therapy where you have both a degradation approach to keep the target suppressed as well as an inhibition approach. We were able to move these BTK degraders you know, very quickly uh, into uh, animal studies. So in collaboration with uh, David Weinstock's lab, uh, we were able to look at a mantle cell lymphoma with a human-derived um, uh, cell transplant model. And you can see here that even with this primitive uh, degrader, which underwent no professional medicinal chemistry optimization, we could already significantly outperform you know, the standard of care abrutinib and then see very nice degradation in vivo. So clearly, with a more professional uh, effort, you could probably get you know, incredibly uh, potent and efficacious uh, BTK uh, degraders. So what about you know, uh, selectivity? So I mentioned you have this potential advantage that the molecule is inducing this protein-protein uh, interaction. And we thought a really neat place to investigate this would be in the case of CDK4 uh, and CDK6, right? So this is a very famous uh, drug target of a blockbuster from Pfizer called Pavlocyclib. Pavlocyclib is a dual inhibitor of CDK4 and CDK6, equal potently inhibits both. And so what Baishan in the lab did was make a simple degrader uh, linking up uh, an imid uh, recruiter, this uh, 123 compound, and then made a negative control with this methylated glutaramid. So these compounds uh, are equipotent, again, like the parent compound, equipotent enzymatic inhibitors of CDK4 and 6. But he made this surprising discovery that this compound would only degrade CDK6. Uh, and I wish we were, could say that we were smart enough to design this rationally, but this was really an accidental um, uh, discovery that it was totally selective. We then confirmed this uh, by proteomics. Uh, really, you know, it almost looks like a cartoon, but really you just see CDK6 uh, being uh, degraded. And then using this nice technology from Promega, we can, we can ascertain the molecular reason for this selectivity. And that's because uh, this molecule can induce nice ternary complex formation with CDK6, uh, but not for uh, CDK4. And so, you know, in collaboration with Georg Winter's lab, um, we we're able to show this. And it really showed that one of the magical things here now is that you can get selectivity because of the protein-protein interface between CDK6 and Cerebron. And that's really exciting, right, for medicinal chemists because normally we're restricted to getting selectivity based on the molecular interaction of the inhibitor uh, with the active site. But now you've got this protein-protein interface to play with. And in the case of CDK6, we have a trajectory that's permissive for Cerebron, but in the case of CDK4, uh, you know, we don't. So that's the good news, we can get selectivity. But as I mentioned in other cases, it's a way to get resistance, right? So now, the enzyme, if you have a clone where you get a mutation in this protein protein interface, you can then block uh, degradation. So uh, in the last you know, section of the talk, I want to talk about this recent uh, study that we've undertaken in collaboration with Eric's lab to really systematically mine more of the, the kinome for um, degraders. So I'll start off talking about sort of the experimental approach uh, and then how we use the, the data set to make some sort of generalized uh, conclusions about uh, things that are important to achieve in, in degradation. And so we decided we needed to build out a bigger a library of promiscuous uh, kinase degraders. And so we, we surveyed our, our lab and, and sort of literature uh, data for different classes of, uh, of compounds. And so we assembled, you know, uh, I forgot the exact number, you know, maybe hundred or so uh, compounds that are either you know type 1 inhibitors type 2 inhibitors we explored you know different uh, lengths of uh, peg uh, connection and then the majority of the library were cerebron recruiters 68 of the compounds 22 were VHL and we did very little work on on IAP so this study is going to need to be repeated uh, once we have more uh, e3 binders and um, you know every couple months 
somebody is finding a new recruiter. Also, some very nice work from uh, Dan and Murrow's lab that we heard about uh, recently, uh, making covalent uh, recruiters of some new ligases. So this study really will need to be re uh, repeated once we have more uh, binders. So this study really, I'd say, is, is mostly li uh, limited. The conclusions are limited to Cerebron and, and VHL. So the approach was to build up this chymase library, uh, pick compounds that showed good uh, cell penetration, good ability to get uh, degradation. We didn't want you know, our results to be too uh, influenced by you know, lack of, of cell penetration. We try to base it on, on chemical diversity of the binders. And then we did global uh, proteomics uh, using TMT uh, quantification uh, to look at you know, one micromolar after uh, five hours. And again, this is a limitation of the, of the data. We wanted to get you know, the immediate uh, consequences of degradation. If you look at longer time points, uh, many kinases have very strong transcriptional uh, effects. And so you degrade, for example, you know, CDK7, and then you, you, you block transcription, and then you see all sorts of other proteins going down. But it is a limitation because we know from, from targeted studies that some degraders are quite slow. So we, we know there's some direct degraders that might take 24 hours to degrade, but those are a little bit harder to deconvolute by the, uh, by the proteomics. And then we try to have you know, some matched pairs where we match Cerebron versus VHL and linkers and, and different uh, connection strategies, and I'll, I'll show some of that. And then we came up with a, a, a degradability uh, score across the, uh, the data set to ask how frequently and how easily we saw different things being uh, degraded. So through this study, uh, we identified um, 172 uh, kinases across uh, this uh, data set as being uh, degraded. We were able to detect uh, 237 additional kinases, which we didn't detect being uh, degraded. And then we missed uh, 118 kinases, presumably uh, because of either um, uh, low expression of that kinase or uh, difficulty in, in, uh, in detection. And so this really expanded you know, the number of, of targets uh, uh, degraded. Uh, previously, a much smaller number of kinases uh, were detected as degraded. I think we, we more than doubled uh, the number of kinases that have been experimentally proven to be uh, degraded through this um, study. And it was not just your uh, typical uh, protein kinases. We also saw many, many kinases in other categories, uh, lipid kinases and pseudokinases. And I think pseudokinases are actually a really exciting opportunity for uh, degraders because mostly they're pseudokinases because they're, they're, they have important scaffolding function, which is exactly the kind of thing you can eliminate uh, with a degrader. But we also saw degradation of metabolic kinases, you know, small molecule kinases uh, and lipid kinases. And you can see uh, the NIH has actually annotated a subset of the kinome as being the so-called uh, dark kinome. These are kinases for which there's less than you know, 10 or 15 uh, publications. And we're actually able to make uh, degraders uh, for uh, a fair number of those understudied uh, kinases. And so one of the cool things that drops out of this kind of analysis is you stumble across you know, some really interesting you know, potential starting points for uh, chemistry. So here is a, a compound. It was actually originally a P38 inhibitor that then was evolved into a RAF inhibitor. But when you make a degrader, in this case, a little VHL-based degrader of this compound, it was remarkably selective for degradation of CDK17 and, and LIMK2, uh, two kinases that you would never have really thought about as being degradable uh, by, uh, you know, by that scaffold. And I think perhaps that's the most important conclusion uh, from this study, you know, the, the major approach in the field is to start from your, your favorite inhibitor for a kinase of interest, but we often find that the most well-degraded kinase may be way down on the list of targets. You know, it may not even be a very strong target, it might be a sort of a one micromolar level affinity, but because of all the, the things that have to happen correctly, that happen, happens to be the most degradable uh, uh, target. And so this really gives you some unexpected starting points for making inhibitors, uh, degraders of uh, targets that you wouldn't anticipate. So we were then able to go through and uh, assign a degradability score, which is obviously biased by the types of compounds that we've looked at. But as this data set you know, continues to grow with, with more scaffolds and more E3 binders, I think it will really 
uh, show uh, amenability towards, um, uh, towards degradation. And so there's clearly some kinases. We have a histogram of what these kinases are that are highly degradable. And for example, Aurora uh, kinase and kinases like BTK and some of the CDKs are, are highly uh, degradable. And that you know, gives you, you know, impetus for making uh, degraders of, of those kinases. So for example, we've been able to make some very uh, potent and selective Aurora degraders uh, based on that information from this uh, alacertinib uh, scaffold. And you can see uh, basically going from that general data set and then making a selective degrader can happen uh, you know, very quickly. So from that alacertinib uh, compound, we made this DRK4 that you know, is a very uh, potent and selective uh, Aurora uh, degrader. So at the end of the day, what you have is this you know, big uh, you know, database of, of kinases and uh, degraded targets. And you can start interrogating uh, this data set and looking for, for trends and uh, differences. So here's a surprising finding where we took a, a quite promiscuous tyrosine active um, compound based on disatinib, which was originally developed as a SARC and LCK inhibitor, but is in fact a quite potent inhibitor of a number of tyrosine kinases, including uh, a lot of the F uh, EPH family kinases. But when you make a degrader from this compound, surprisingly, it's a very selective degrader of the C-terminal uh, SARC uh, kinase. And here's the, uh, the profiles. You can see CSK is degraded, just to orient people. So this on the y-axis is the uh, extent of degradation. And this is a p-value for the, the, the confidence in, in the uh, significance of that degradation. But you can also see it still degrades perhaps a little bit uh, we one and BLK, which happen to be two other highly degradable uh, kinases. So unlike the kinase inhibitor game where the hardest targets to get rid of are the most homologous kinases based on similarity in the ATP binding site, the challenge in kinase degraders is often related to the most easily degraded uh, kinase. Uh, and so it may not be based on uh, ATP site similarity, which is actually uh, good because that gives you a completely orthogonal way to get selectivity across the kinome. So it's not all about the homology of the ATP binding site, it's a more complicated function of recognition by the ligase and degradability. And so the good news for making selective kinase probes is you have a completely orthogonal way now to get bizarrely selective uh, compounds. So for example, it's very hard to envision how you would get a selective CSK inhibitor because actually most of the SARC family kinases uh, inhibitors have cross-reactivity with CSK. Uh, it's very hard to get a compound that would just be a, a traditional orthosteric CSK inhibitor. So that was sort of part one of the story. And then, and then part two was to really do a deeper study with more promiscuous um, uh, kinase degraders. So here is the histogram of you know, kinase degraded, uh, number of kinases degraded by different compounds. And so we picked a series of compounds, four compounds that were the most promiscuous uh, degraders. So we could do a limited number of experiments, but interrogate you know, the most number of uh, kinases with those promiscuous uh, binders. And so the first question that we set out to uh, address was you know, this general question in the field of uh, how much engagement of the target do you need uh, to see uh, degradation. And so the way this was set up was we took these uh, four highly promiscuous uh, degraders, we treated cells for um, uh, five hours with one micromolar, then quantified the proteins, and then in parallel, we did a kinative experiment. Again, so this is a method where uh, after treatment with the degraders, which is done in the same way, in the lysates, you chase with an ATP uh, biotin uh, probe that labels uh, all the kinases, and then you pull down with the streptavidin, and you're actually measuring uh, target engagement. So we're basically in parallel trying to measure uh, the difference between uh, degradation and, uh, and target engagement. And so here's uh, the data on one of the um, uh, promiscuous compounds. And so across the x-axis is the, the native data. So things over here are, are highly binding. And on the y-axis is, uh, is the degradation. And so as you'd expect, there are some targets that are highly bound uh, that are also degraded. 
But then you'll see things like this. So this, this target is less than 20% bound, but it's as well degraded as some of these other uh, targets. And then if you actually look across these four promiscuous compounds, right, these are all four promiscuous kinase binders, you can see how you can bend them between um, no target engagement, but you get degradation, or you get target engagement and degradation, or you get target engagement and, and no degradation. And you can see it's actually different for the different compounds, right? So here you've got a, a really good, you know, degrader compound, it degrades a bunch of things, but you don't get very much uh, target engagement. And again, this is because, you know, um, there's some complexes that you form that might be not very catalytically competent, right? So if they're not very catalytically competent, then you really need good ternary complex formation. But if they're massively catalytically competent, uh, then you just need very transient interaction and that can be, uh, you know, good enough. So, um, you know, we, we do think, you know, you need ternary complex formation, but you can't use that necessarily to prioritize uh, what's going to be uh, degradable. And you can see how different it is across these different compounds about where these, uh, where these stripes are. Uh, and so it's compound dependent and then also uh, uh, target dependent. And so you really need to look for function, in this case, uh, degradation, and not just uh, ternary complex formation. So, um, sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. So that, that, that was on the engagement. So then on, 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 on ternary complex formation, we did a, an additional experiment where we looked at um, flag tag pull down with, um, uh, with Cerebron, right? So in the previous experiment, we we're looking at target engagement by, uh, by Kinative. Here we did uh, flag pull down with Cerebron to look at um, uh, complex formation. And again, did this uh, same analysis so looking at um, uh, complex formation. And again, you can do the same uh, analysis about um, whether you get a complex and degradation. And again, you see these quite different profiles. So you know, this compound, most of the targets that were degraded, you don't actually see a, a stable uh, ternary uh, complex. So just yeah, to conclude, you, you, need, you need to get you know, binding to the kinase. You know, that's clear. And you, and you do likely need to get a ternary complex formation. But the stability of that complex and the duration of that complex uh, is completely variable across the kinome and across uh, you know, different, uh, different compounds. So we then also wanted to look at uh, protein expression. So there's been a lot of discussion about you know, our targets that are more you know, highly expressed or lowly expressed, you know, more easily or differently degraded. And so we looked across three different cell lines. And I'm showing you here the data for uh, four compounds across those three cell lines and a, and a Venn diagram. So the first thing sort of to notice here is that uh, there are you know, clearly targets that are commonly degraded in all three cell types. But then, depending on the cell type, you'll often see unique things uh, you know, degraded. And, and sometimes that's because of expression, uh, but sometimes, I mean, whether it's there or not, but sometimes it's uniquely degraded in that uh, cell system. And that's why it's you know, very important uh, not only to look in your cell system of interest, but then extrapolating forward to when you're going into, you know, in vivo systems, animals, and, and beyond, um, you really need to uh, assign empirically when you do or don't see um, uh, degradation. Here's um, the frequency of degradation versus the uh, average relative expression, and you can basically see there's not a correlation. You, you see things that are highly um, abundant that are degraded, and you see things that are uh, lowly abundant uh, that, are, that are degraded. You can also then look at the correlation in expression of the you know, ubiquitilation uh, machinery. And clearly, the ubiquitilation machinery, uh, the, the CUL4A, the CUL4B, and the DDD1, they need to be there um, uh, in order to get a degradation. So you do see a positive correlation there. And as I mentioned, if you, you know, silence uh, expression of these or disable the function of these, you very quickly disable, you know, the ability of the compounds, uh, you know, to work. Uh, and then you can see how the, you know, number of, of targets change for these different, uh, for these different compounds. So what about, you know, comparing, you know, different uh, ligases? Is it, you know, equivalent to recruit Cerebron versus uh, VHL? And so we looked at a number of um, uh, matched pairs. And as you'd expect, 
you know, in general, a lot of targets do fall along the, the diagonal, meaning that you can degrade them either with a Cerebron based recruiter or a, a VHL based recruiter. But you can also see things that fall, you know, off uh, the diagonal, right, that are, are much better recruited and degraded uh, by um, VHL uh, versus a Cerebron. And, you know, sometimes, you know, that relates to how um, permissive it is, i.e., you know, that, you know, one ligase allows a, a wider range of linkers, and if you hit the right linker, then you'll get a degradation. But in other cases, it really relates to uh, that, the you know, for a more intimate protac, that the protein-protein interface is more conducive with one ligase versus, uh, you know, another, right? So you can see, you know, good overlap, but also some unique uh, targets. And I expect we're going to continue uh, to see that as we learn how to recruit more and more uh, ligases. What about uh, the sort of linkerology and, uh, you know, connection uh, methodology? And so there's been sort of a lot of, uh, you know, one by one observation across the field. But again, this proteomic study really allowed us to look at this uh, systematically. And so, for example, here we made some uh, matched pairs where we looked at different uh, peg linker lengths, and then we looked at different um, connection points to the image. So here, for example, an ortho connection versus a, uh, a meta connection. And so you can see for this particular compound, this classical diamino, you know, pyrimidine-based compound, we see very good uh, congruence. Uh, we get, you know, pretty comparable degradation for both. But this happens to be uh, the uh, highly enriched for the kinases that we easily see being uh, degraded. So in general, uh, the more easily degraded kinases are also more permissive, uh, both in terms of linker length and in terms of uh, you know connection point. But then you also find cases where you'll see you know very um, clear SAR uh, for a given linker length and, and um, a connection uh, methodology. So these protac compounds, you know, in addition to um, degrading the uh, target of interest will often continue to degrade the imid uh, targets. So these are the, the so-called you know, neo-substrates of, uh, of the target. And again, this systematic study really allowed us to see you know, when you do see this and when you don't. So for example, here, there's a, there's a big difference for you know, ZNF653 uh, depending on whether it's ortho or meta on the imid. And you can see that systematically across the series. Whereas for you know this zinc finger, uh, both connection uh, points for the image don't have a have a big uh, difference, and so that's something else you can pick out from this sort of systematic uh, profiling uh, data, and that's quantified here in this uh, you know bar graph about whether you continue to see these image off targets or you don't see the image off targets depending on how you do the connection to the to the to the E three recruiter, and so this is going to be really important. As we, you know, look at, you know, VHL and we look at other um, E3 recruiters in the future, uh, clearly we have the potential to perturb uh, natural substrates of those ligases, and we have to know about, you know, when the bivalent molecule does that and when it doesn't. What about, uh, you know, the P97 uh, AAA TPase uh, chaperone? So this is a protein that's well known to help, you know, un unravel proteins before they get fed into the uh, proteasome. But we don't really know how generally, you know, important this is to protac-based uh, degradation. And so here, uh, Catherine did this really nice experiment where she took a promiscuous degrader, one of the four really promiscuous degraders, and then co-treated with the PAN, you know, P97 ATPase inhibitor. And so what you can see is, you know, normally you get all these things degraded, but the P97 inhibitor collapses most of them, okay? So it actually almost looks like a proteasome inhibitor in terms of its ability to rescue uh, degradation. And that's actually a really neat conclusion because normally it had been thought that maybe this triple ATPase only was needed for extracting proteins in big you know, protein complexes. But this says that even for nicely soluble monomeric you know, cytoplasmic kinases, P97 activity is, uh, is quite important. So I think even for very you know, basic fundamental biology questions like this, this proteomic strategy is really, um, is really uh, useful. And you can see how this uh, happens across different uh, targets. So uh, we're hopefully in the next couple of weeks going to release a publicly accessible 
um, uh, database that's going to be hosted at the Fisher Lab, which will make all of this proteomic data uh, available. And we've made a, a simple uh, search interface, so you can either search by your favorite um, kinase to see which compounds work, or uh, reciprocally, you can look up the compounds and see what they're, um, uh, what's degraded. Or if you're a you know informatics jockey, you can try downloading and analyzing the data uh, as you um, uh, as you wish. And I think this would be a really great you know resource to stimulate uh, the greater development across the um, across the community. So in summary, uh, in this paper that'll hopefully come out and sell you know in a couple of months, we've created this open access resource uh, to really show that there's at least uh, 220. Uh, degradable kinases, and of course, this is going to expand as we make more degraders and more uh, uh, ligases. And I think we've really provided a good uh, benchmark for how to do this uh, that's applicable to other uh, gene families, uh, uh, proteases, serine hydrolases, GPCRs, uh, and others. And then I think this methodology is really useful for asking, you know, ve very general and, and, and broad questions about the ubiquitin uh, proteasome experiment that you can now do in a very uh, multi-dimensional way uh, through these promiscuous uh, degraders. So let me stop and again, uh, thank you know, the incredible people uh, that, that did this uh, uh, research. So uh, Fleur Ferguson uh, was the champion in our lab to gather all the inhibitors and figure out the strategy. The proteomics was led by uh, Catherine Donovan together with several team members in, um, in Eric's lab. We've got you know, good assistance from across the globe. Uh, Tebo Sim across in Korea uh, sent us kinase degraders, had, as did uh, Tan Li, who's at SIOC in, uh, in China. Uh, we had uh, great help setting up the entire degradation platform uh, by Roddick. As I mentioned, you have to sort of totally reinvent the, the biochemistry to support these um, uh, projects. Uh, and then we've collaborated with a number of other uh, labs, and I'll stop there and be happy to take uh, questions.